took at the Schulich School of Medicine uh, and Dentistry in Canada. Okay, in 2017, she was the youngest. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you her age, but she was the youngest doctor that became one of the youngest black female cardiologists in South Africa. Okay, one of the other achievements that she has is uh, the gold medallion awarded to her by uh, the President of South Africa for taking care of the late uh, the President Nelson Mandela. She also was one of the top 200 male and guardian under 35 achievers in 2018 under the healthcare promising young leadership section. Dr. Mtwesi has also several, several uh, publications, one of them being uh, uh, stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation and uh, the role of oral anticoagulants in the medical clinics. And that was she published in 2019. That's just a short brief on a CV. So I'll ask Dr. Mtwesi then to continue Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, apologies again for starting late, but uh, I'm quite honored uh, to be talking to you tonight about one of my favorite things to talk about, which is atrial fibrillation. Um, I'm just, I'm not going to go into detail about, you know, the basics of atrial fibrillation, but I'm just going to give you a brief idea of what is happening, at least in 2023. Um, it's not big. Okay. There we go. Okay, in terms of disclosures, well, I do have educational grants from Johnson & Johnson and uh, from Biotronic. I am affiliated with WITS and the Western University in Canada. So the layout of the talk, um, I want it to be a very interactive talk. Um, if you want to stop me as I speak, um, I don't want to waste your time. I want to make sure that we all understand what, we, what I'll be talking about. And um, so just stop me if you have any questions. I'm going to touch on a couple of things which I have listed and um, going ahead. How bad is the situation? <clears throat> if you were to speak to me about 20 years ago, uh, being a South African and talk about atrial fibrillation or ischemic heart disease or cardiac conditions for that matter, I wouldn't be really worried. But in 2023, we've seen what has happened. Every corner you turn into, you see fast foods, you see obese people. So this is a big problem. Um, atrial fibrillation, as you would probably know, it is a most common clinical arrhythmia. The prevalence, when you look at global burden, it's about 1.1 to 2%, and the overall incidence is about 4.5%. Again, if you look at the burden of atrial fibrillation, it's taken from studies that are mainly done um, in the Western world. There isn't really much that has been done in South Africa, at least from a randomized control trial perspective. However, we do have data from Africa. If you look at this uh, graph, you the orange uh, dots show you what we expect atrial fibrillation to be at least by 2050. And the blue dots is what is currently happening. It is a bit frightening to just realize that atrial fibrillation is actually on an increase, especially in Africa. Africa is estimated by 2050 to actually have more atrial fibrillation compared to the US and Europe. So that means we should be doing something right now. If you're seeing an obese patient, a patient with sleep apnea, do something about it. Again, why do we fuss so much about atrial fibrillation? This slide is a bit, it's a bit too much and annoying, I know. But I thought I would just incorporate a couple of things. We all remember the virtuous triad from medical school. So when we talk about atrial fibrillation, the first thing that should come to your mind is stroke prevention and stroke. So how do we end up with stroke? 
So what you first happens as you would previously, as you would know, for vitreous triad, you need blood, blood stasis, you need, need endothelial damage and hypercoagulability. So what happens with atrial fibrillation then? In atrial fibrillation, you have hypercontractility of your atrium and you have loss of atrial kick and therefore stagnation of blood, which will contribute to blood stasis. You also have loss of contraction due to atrial fibrillation and with time you get LA enlargement. And all these things contribute to blood stasis. And then how do we then get hypercoagulability and endothelial dysfunction? So atrial fibrillation, atrial myopathy in, in fact, which is what happens in atrial fibrillation with time. You get inflammation of the atrial muscle. Unfortunately, studies have been done looking at RETS, for example, um, doing MRIs and doing histology studies. What's surprising is MRI actually does not pick up atrial myopathy. You will have a patient that has develops atrial fibrillation, but when you do an MRI, you find nothing. But when you do histology on those patients, you actually find inflammation in the atria. So prevention then becomes key in terms of risks that are, uh, are contributing to atrial fibrillation um, uh, development. Again, in terms of pathophysiology, <clears throat> what happens when a patient has atrial fibrillation? Oftentimes we don't know what comes first. Is the heart failure coming first or is did the atrial fibrillation come first? This is something that is very hard to solve many a times. So if you have atrial fibrillation, you lose your atrial kick. The heart is obviously irregular. You have decrease in coronary, coronary flow. And oftentimes you have excessive rates um, which lead to LV dysfunction, which lead to end diastolic increase in end diastolic systolic pressures, new humoral changes, that is um, your ACE changes, and then you get atrial stretch, and then it becomes a vicious cycle. But again, this you can control if you control um, your risk factors. As you would remember, atrial fibrillation has a spectrum. We have, we, the patient can come with, with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation persistent and long-standing. Paroxysmal is usually when a patient comes in with atrial fibrillation less than seven days, and they often have atrial fibrillation. Oftentimes they come to your office and when you check the ECG, it's normal sinus rhythm, but these patients often complain to you that they have palpitations. It is very important if you have a patient that has hypertension, for instance, or a patient that is obese or a patient that has sleep apnea and often coming to you with palpitations, in terms of managing that patient, don't dismiss the patient. You should look for atrial fibrillation and ways to look for atrial fibrillation will be halters. And oftentimes we do 24 hour halters and we don't find anything. You can take it a step further if you have a patient that you think has the phenotype for developing atrial fibrillation and put in a loop recorder. So if you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, this is where we can do something about atrial fibrillation in the true sense, because here you can actually reverse what is happening by modifying the risk factors and also by managing the atrial fibrillation early. If you look at this schematic, this is your cells, your um, myocardial cells, and the white part here is fibrosis. As you can see, with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, there isn't really much fibrosis that has occurred. But when you look at long-standing atrial fibrillation, there is gaps. And how you form uh, abnormal rhythms is if you have normal conducting tissue, normal conducting tissue and abnormal tissue. If there is no abnormal tissue and normal tissue, you would not have abnormal rhythms. But because of this fibrosis, this is what you get, this is why you get atrial fibrillation. So oftentimes we want to get this patient from an electrophysiology perspective, I want to get the patients that are still paroxysmals because these patients, most of the time, I'm able to keep them AFib free at least for four to five years. When I get to this point of persistent and long-standing atrial fibrillation, the truth is we have really minimal therapies that can actually help these patients. But again, what happens to the atrias? When you look at this paroxysmal persistence and long, long, long standing. So we think atrial fibrillation usually has triggers. And oftentimes those triggers come from the pulmonary veins, as you can see here. And if I go in at this point, the patient has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. You send the patient for a definitive therapy, which is ablation. If I ablate at this time, outcomes are better. 
If I ablate here, they still benefit compared to drugs, but it's better for you to refer the patient when they are still here. Because I know the triggers oftentimes are just from the pulmonary veins. You can get triggers from different places, pulmonary veins, and sometimes just the atria itself. And oftentimes you can get triggers from the veins of muscles, which becomes a very terrible thing to ablate. But with time, a patient has atrial fibrillation. As you can see, you get more fibrosis with time. So this is like more than seven days, this is like going to a year. If the patient has persistent atrial fibrillation and then you get to a point where you and the patient decide there's nothing we can do about your atrial fibrillation, you are done, permanent atrial fibrillation, we're gonna just give you drugs, okay? So it is very important for you to understand how the patient progresses from paroxysmal to long-standing atrial fibrillation because outcomes in terms of management are actually much better when we tackle the patient at an earlier stage. Again, <clears throat> if you look at this, um, this, these are epithelial cells, these are cardiac myocytes, this is uh, fibrosis, and this is electrical tissue. With time, this is what happens. You have more um, uh, fibrosis and therefore conduction gets uh, disturbed and then you get atrial fibrillation. But where it starts, where this is important for primary care physicians and um, other physicians, it's tackling these things. If you have a patient with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and sleep apnea, it doesn't matter how much amiodarone I give that patient or how much ablation I do. If these things are not controlled, which makes core managing atrial fibrillation very important, it's not just about going in and you know ablating. It, these are very key in atrial fibrillation management. You can have a patient that has controlled hypertension, but don't forget about the fact that they are obese and that obesity is contributing to many things. And I mean, there's other therapies for obesity at this point in time. So we shouldn't really leave patients um, still not exercising and obese at this point. Okay, I'll give you like a, a quick case so that we at least have something to talk about. I recently had this 60 year old patient, hypertensive diabetic, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and he came in with just fatigue and palpitation. A ECG just showed atrial fibrillation, and he had a normal exam and echo. So what do we do next? This is exactly the patient that I want to see, because the patient has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. From what we spoke about in terms of atrial remodeling, we know that we can still reverse some stuff with this patient. But again, he's diabetic and hypertensive. What should a family doctor be doing at this point? He should be risk, risk stratifying the patient. So in terms of managing the patient, what are the therapies that are involved and what should we be thinking about? So in terms of AF management, we have to think about embolic management that is using drugs. You do the stroke risk for the patient and you decide what drugs you want to put the patient on. I mean, we have a lot of drugs that are currently available, warfarin, but I tend to favor um, the newer anticoagulants. Um, I mean, data is out there to prove that these new anticoagulants are actually not inferior to warfarin. And more than anything, it gives just the patient, you know, the flexibility of not going to the hospital to get blood tested all the time. And then what else is available? So we have ablation. This is for ablation, as you would know, is an invasive procedure. So early referral for ablation, I'm gonna talk extensively about, about ablation, but we do have ablation available for management of atrial fibrillation for rhythm control. It's rate and rhythm control. And then pacing for, for instance, if you have an elderly patient, you don't want to expose the patient to long procedures for atrial fibrillation. And they actually have, low and high rates, those patients, we usually pace them and do AV nodal abl ablation for them. I'll talk about that later on. And then there's drugs. I will dwell into this later on about drugs for rhythm and rate control. As you would know about the AFEM and the RACE trial, we know that controlling the rate for atrial fibrillation actually had good outcomes. But again, there's newer data that shows us that rhythm control is actually key. And then there are those patients that cannot get drugs, um, uh, anticoagulation drugs. What do we do for them? We do have surgical um, options for those patients, which we'll talk about in a bit. <clears throat> 
Okay, this is again a business slide. I decided to just do it like this because oftentimes we would say chat va score, chat score, and you don't understand what that means in terms of risk of stroke. So chat va score, you can use the chat va score or even the chat score to risk stratify your patients for stroke prevention. So what's important for atrial fibrillation is actually stroke prevention mostly because that's associated with mortality. And so what a patient comes to you you have to check a couple of things. Have they had heart failure? Are they hypertensive? Are they older than 75? Are they diabetic, stroke, vascular? You can get this in an app and you just quickly calculate in your rooms and you decide if you give the patient anticoagulation or not. But the importance of this is because we want to see what the percentage, what the risk of the patient developing a stroke is long-term. As you can see, when a patient has a chart vasco of two and above, it actually, your risk of stroke actually increases. So it is actually, if you get a patient and they have a chart risk, you'll ask me, okay, I have a patient and their chart vasco is one, what do I do? So there are certain cases where you have a patient that's in the gray zone and you as a physician have to make that decision with the patient. And the patient has to make that decision knowing very well that there's a stroke risk and there's bleeding risk. Okay, why do we fuss so much about stroke in atrial fibrillation patients? It's because patients that have stroke that are secondary to atrial fibrillation, they have poorer survival rates. They have greater disabilities. They have higher recurrence rate of stroke and the healthcare cost is humongous. So we really have to stress about this. I'm sure none of us wants to have a stroke. So that's why when you have an AFib patient, you always have to check the stroke risk. Again, in terms of oral anticoagulation, what is available to us? Warfarin has been available for years and most people like using warfarin, but I mean, there's extensive work that has been done on uh, um, uh, new oral anticoagulants. I do have a review article that I've recently written about that. If you want, you can just Google it and uh, review it. But more than anything, just for you to know, they, they are not inferior to warfarin and it's more convenient for patients to be using these. But just like anything, there are patients that are outliers when it comes to um, uh, them being given um, anticoagulation. Again, that's just to show you that with increase in the chart score, the annual stroke risk actually increases. So it's important for you to remember this slide. Again, why worry about anticoagulation? I'll stress it again. As the age increases, as the patient has more comorbidities, the patient is at most uh, risk of stroke. But again, should we just be giving a stroke prevention to everybody? You have to um, make sure that the patient's bleeding risk is not high. The bleeding risk, the has bled score was a non-inferiority study or a negative study to some degree, but it is still important. If a patient comes to you, they have a bleeding ulcer, they have atrial fibrillation, what are you gonna do? There's still options in terms of stroke prevention, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that the patient can bleed with, especially with some of the no, uh, newer anticoagulants. So you have to be very cognizant of that. So as much as we don't do it all the time, but the has blood score, you have to calculate it. But more than calculating that, you have to check with the patient. Do you have ulcers? Have, do you have bleeding ulcers? Do you have PR bleeding? Do you have nose bleeds? Do you have, so that you know, as you're giving the anticoagulants, if the patient has, is at a higher risk of bleeding or not. So this is a recent case as well. Uh, well, so I had an 82 year old chronic renal failure and hypertensive diabetic dyslipidemia, previous stroke. So you can see that the chart score is just high here. So what do you do for this patient? They've got chronic renal failure. They have everything that you can think of that makes them not to be ideal for uh, stroke prevention. And this is where we talk about LA closure uh, devices. So for patients that have a high risk of, bleed, uh, of bleeding and they have a high risk of uh, stroke, you still have to give the patient the option. 
the option to have an LA closure device, because if you are not comfortable as a doctor to give anticoagulation, you have to give the patient options. So this is something else that we do, LA closure devices. You can see, because of the anatomy of the, of the, of the LA appendage, this is just contrast inside. I'm not sure if everyone can see. This is contrast inside the LA appendage. There's a big clot there. Because of the structure of the LA appendage, patients tend to form clots here. And if this clot goes, it goes to the brain, goes to the lower limbs. So preventing this is really important. So these are some of the devices that we currently have for LA closure devices, and they are available in South Africa. So you can't close off patients because they have a high bleeding risk, still refer them for LA closure devices. Again, atrial fibrillation, what do guidelines say and what does data say in terms of management, which is rhythm control? If you look at uh, guidelines, ESC and American guidelines, they will always tell you to start with drugs. But often drugs that we use for atrial fibrillation have toxicity, especially if you're aiming for rhythm control, not, ra uh, not rate. If you're talking rate, you're talking about beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. If you're aiming rhythm, you're talking about amiodarone, flaconide, uh, propafenone, procanamide, whatever you have, sotalol. So those drugs tend to have many side effects and some patients don't even tolerate them. So there's atrial fibrillation on the other side, which we can do with cryoablation, which is using cold temperatures to uh, isolate the veins, or we can use something called uh, RF, which is right of frequency ablation, which is uses heat. I'll start off by antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, I, I have a, a slide with all the uh, um, references at the end, if you need any of these references. A lot of information is available when it comes to antiarrhythmic drugs. In the beginning, before technology really got better, antiarrhythmic drugs were the core was was in the core of managing atrial fibrillation. But with time, things have changed, as you would know. And and if we in this particular study, they compared placebo to antiarrhythmic drugs. And obviously antiarrhythmic drugs did better in terms of AFib burden, in terms of lifestyle, lifestyle after AFib, in terms of AFib burden, the patient just did better. But what has happened since then? We've compared drugs to ablation. This is, uh, most of this work is done by Andrede. He's a big AFib guy. And um, he compared your common drugs like amiodarone, flaconide with uh, beta blockers, with ablation. And obviously, ablation did better compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. It's not that antiarrhythmic drugs don't work. They do work. But the burden, what's important for patients when it comes to AFib control is the burden of atrial fibrillation. So in terms of burden of atrial fibrillation, ablation did way better compared to drugs. And also symptoms. Again, Antiarrhythmic drugs work. I'm not gonna say antiarrhythmic drugs don't work. They do work, but if you're giving a amiodarone, one, you check the, 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 the thyroid function, you check the LFTs, and you tell the patient when they walk outside, they must cover their faces and whatnot. So it tends to be a burden for the patient. And oftentimes we have studies, recent studies that have proven that Antiarrhythmic drugs compared to uh, ablation. Ablation did better in terms of mortality and lifestyle after. So um, this is just, uh, it, it just shows you in terms of progression of atrial fibrillation, this graph here, from paroxysmal again to permanent atrial fibrillation. You have your AF triggers, you have modifiable substrate where I keep saying, manage your hypertension, manage your obesity, manage your sleep apnea and the patient will do better. And again, from what we learned from this study is that early atrial fibrillation ablation patients actually do better compared to drugs. And um, before that trial was published, they actually did another trial, which was called the Cabana trial. So in the Cabana trial, it was more like uh, comparing, they were comparing, they were taking patients that had ablation and comparing to drugs. It wasn't like an ablation to ablation protocol uh, type of thing. But the problem with this trial, we had a lot of patients 30% of the patient who had, who had uh, drugs, they had to go and have ablation. So the fact that we had many crossovers, it makes this trial a bit questionable. However, we still see even with the Cabana trial that ablation was actually better compared to drugs. <laughs> 
So what do we know about ablation trials and what have we seen with ablation trials? So ablation trials have told us here, I have some of the ablation trials, your LEAF, stop AF and cryo first. So all these trials have proven that AF ablation reduced atrial tachyarrhythmia recurrence. It had greater improvement in quality of life. They had reduced healthcare utilization. They had reduced hospitalization. But you're gonna ask me what type of patients were included in these trials. In most of these trials, they actually had patients with paroxysmal AF, not, not persistent AF. They did a fraction, have a fraction of persistent AF, but the study that had persistent AF was the Cabana trial. And even in the Cabana trial, we saw improvement with um, uh, ablation. So again, um, this is uh, an ablation trial where they use cryoablation, which is cold temperatures. I mean, we've had many trials that compared cryo to RF, and at the end of the day, they all give the same results. There isn't really much in terms of uh, um, differences between the two uh, modalities of therapy. But again, you can see uh, patients that were highly symptomatic, they had low LA volumes or normal LA volumes, they actually did better with ablation and monitoring afterwards. And what then after ablation? It's very important. This is why atrial fibrillation does not end with the cardiologist. Everyone should be cognizant of what we do because oftentimes I see the patient, I ablate the patient and I refer the patient back to the person who referred the patient back to me. To me. So it's important, as you can see, I mean, the dark blue is drug only and the dark orange is uh, ablation and then the this is ablation with uh, and, and patients who are not on drugs. So combining ablation with drugs, at least for two months after the ablation, the patients actually do better in terms of AFib control. But after two months, you can then win the patient off uh, your antiarrhythmic drugs. And then is there a difference between persistent AF and uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? Like you can see here, I mean, you, the results are almost similar in it, meaning that even patients with persistent AF should still be given an opportunity to be in sinus rhythm. So don't say because the patient has persistent AF, I'm not gonna refer this patient for ablation or uh, AFib management, you still have to try. Be it we try with drugs or with um, ablation, we still have to try taking the patient to atrial into sinus rhythm. Now, I'm just gonna briefly talk about pace and ablate. Pace and ablate is a strategy that we use for patients, oftentimes older patients or patients with low ejection fractions where you think um, they at risk for putting the patient, because AFib ablation can take anything between two to four hours. And oftentimes older patients don't tolerate that. And uh, patients with heart failure can't take it. Oftentimes we do what we call the pace and ablate strategy. And this also applies in patients that have, you have a patient that has atrial fibrillation and one time their heart rate is 160 and the other time the heart rate is 50. And in that case, you don't know if you can give the patient an antiarrhythmic or rate controlling drug. So we pace the patient. If they have low ejection fraction, we'll put in a CRT and then we call the patient back and we do an AV node ablation. This has been shown to actually improve quality of life for patients and they decrease hospital visits so they do better generally. And oftentimes if you have patients that you think they're not gonna benefit for, uh, from ablation, that is pulmonary vein isolation, then you can send these patients for pace and ablate strategy. I know it's a lot to take in, but uh, I will just continue. Again, I'm not going to, I'm gonna stress the importance of doing uh, risk uh, management. This. This is why a cardiologist is the worst person to manage um, cardiac conditions, because I believe cardiac conditions should be managed at the primary care level and also by physicians. So oftentimes a patient will never come to me because they have diabetes. They will never come to me because they have hypertension. So that is why it is very important for this risk to be managed at a primary care level or even at a physician level. So what have we learned? that treatment of atrial fibrillation results in improved outcomes. Ablation as a first line therapy is better than antiarrhythmic drugs. 
Ablation after antiarrhythmic trial failure, a drug failure, results in greater magnitude of benefit. And electrical pulmonary vein isolation can be effectively performed with cryo and RF. So we need to rethink our concept of AF classification. Because if I'm saying to you that persistent atrial fibrillation still benefits from ablation, then it means we have to redefine what persistent and uh, what paroxysmal atrial fibrillation means. Because at the end of the day, if the therapies are gonna be the same, then it means we need to redefine this patient so that the persistent patients don't get don't end up being mismanaged because of a definition that was actually put in there a couple of years ago. And then I will quickly talk about periop atrial fibrillation because this is something that happens all the time in the hospitals. Be it is a patient that has had an appendix removed or a patient that's post cardiac therapy. How do you manage these patients? So uh, most of the time, this atrial fibrillation management in periop uh, setting should be um, it's case based because each patient that comes to you is different. But what we are seeing now, there's more patients that develop atrial fibrillation after you know, procedures. And this is associated with increased overall risk of in-hospital mortality and morbidity. And it is an independent risk and predictor for stroke. So it is very difficult to predict which patients are gonna develop atrial fibrillation periop, but oftentimes patients with hypertension, diabetes, and they are obese, these are things that you are to look out for. Then how do you manage these patients? Um, management of this patient is obviously, it starts with um, individualizing their therapies. Okay, let me go to the slide. So it's case-based, like I mentioned. If a patient had pre-existing pre atrial fibrillation, obviously their AFib control has to be con AFib control management therapies have to be continued. If a patient was on beta blockers, we highly suggest that the patient continues on beta blockers. Don't stop the beta blockers because the patient is going for uh, an operation. And if the patient did not have atrial fibrillation before the procedure, then there are many things that you have to consider is does the patient need anticoagulation? How long up before the start of atrial fibrillation have, where you consulted. For instance, if you have a patient that develops atrial fibrillation post say, you know, um, nose procedure, let's say uh, like a whatever, they do something for ENT, patient gets atrial fibrillation, you get called within, you know, 10 hours of that patient getting atrial fibrillation. What's important is the, and you are sure that the patient has not had atrial fibrillation before and does do not have any risk for atrial fibrillation. In that case, you have to make sure that you revert the patient back to sinus rhythm in a safe way though. So <clears throat> starting with intraop, how do I manage a patient that develops AFib intraoperative operatively? So this depends on the hemodynamic status of the patient. Obviously a patient that is hemodynamically unstable, those patients need to be cardioverted. And then um, a patient that has uh, rapid ventricular rates with low BPs, again, you need to cardiovert. A patient that has rapid heart uh, rate with normal BPs, it is reasonable to start something like a beta blocker. And then amiodarone, obviously is freely available and in terms of conversion rate comparing beta blockers something like bisoprolol or cavidolol to amiodarone amiodarone does better but you also have to remember that there is a stroke risk with amiodarone as well so post operatively this is now after the operation what do you do so for stable cases it is reasonable to do some bloods look for thyroid uh, disease um, look for sepsis, things that predispose the patient to um, 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 atrial fibrillation. Do an echo to rule out an acute myocardial infarct, rule out a pulmonary embolus. Like I said, beta blockers are very reasonable. If the patient has had atrial fibrillation for less than 48 hours and has never had atrial fibrillation before, it is reasonable to cardiovert the patient. And if the patient has had atrial fibrillation for more than 48 hours, you would need a TE before you cardiovert the patient because the stroke risk then will be high. It is key to assess for stroke risk again, but the key thing with periop atrial fibrillation, cardioverting the patient to sinus rhythm is very important. 
So again, causes and risk factors for periop atrial fibrillation, they can be patient factors and surgical factors. So in terms of patient factors, age, elderly people tend to develop atrial fibrillation more compared to younger patients. And race, like black patients tend to be less um, prone to developing atrial fibrillation compared to uh, other races and history of atrial, fibrilla atrial fibrillation in the past, chronic renal failure, sepsis, asthma, and COPDs. These are patient-related risk factors. In terms of the surgery-related risk factors, patients who develop hypovolemia or patients who are hypoxic, intraoperative hypotension, vasopressor use, trauma, pain, type of surgery, hypoglycemia, like type of surgery, I mean like cardiac surgery, obviously, is at a more risk of de developing atrial fibrillation compared to any other surgeries. And I think that is the end. If there's any questions, I am happy to address them at this point. I know this was a bit rushed, but atrial fibrillation, I think, is a big topic. And um, I mean, I can talk about anticoagulation the whole day. I can talk about ablation for two hours. So I think it's a big um, uh, topic to cover, but I tried to just cover, I didn't want to be redundant and tell you things that you know. I tried to just give you, you know, the small nuggets. If there's any questions at this point, I'm really happy to uh, take them. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tracy. Uh, yes. a very complex discussion. <laughs> also, but it's very clear and about yeah. atrial fibrillation and what we need to be doing. Yeah. Uh, I think we learn, we learn quite a lot about these issues that you've, you've raised here. And um, it was quite interesting uh, that you're saying that uh, if you had a choice from your point of view of using medication drugs and atrial fibrillation, the, the atrial fibrillation uh, is the best option to use. I think most of the times the doctors would tend to want to start a patient on medication. That's a comment I wanted to make, yeah. 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 Okay, colleagues, um, is there anyone who's got a question that they want to, to ask uh, Dr. Tracy? And even those, if there are one or two people sitting there at uh, BH at Kutselong, if you have a question, please let me know. Or Dr. Tessie, because they are next to you. Uh, oh, you may there's want somebody, to, yeah. There's a question. Okay, there's, is, somebody, is there there's place, a somebody who has asked about the use of digoxin. Is there any yeah, place, is there any place digoxin, for digoxin which yeah, was yeah. advocated earlier in our careers? So digoxin yeah. currently for atrial fibrillation management, we don't actually use it. Um, there are cases where you can use digoxin. One, the reason we don't like digoxin is because it has a narrow therapeutic index. And comparing digoxin to uh, beta blockers, there's been studies that have been done to actually compare digoxin to beta blockers. And beta blockers have mortality benefit. They prevent, as you would know, uh, uh, into, they did better in terms of AFib control, number one. Number two, there was also a mortality benefit associated with uh, beta blockers. And oftentimes the patients that come to you with atrial fibrillation have diabetes, hypertension, they've had heart attacks, and there's robust data that has shown us that beta beta blockers actually for preventing recurrent um, heart attacks do better. And these patients often have heart failure as well. As much as heart failure, digoxin currently, there's a lot of work that has been done for digoxin and heart failure in the current years. Um, it's usually not in the first three therapies that we give our patients. And you would know that beta blockers have shown uh, mortality benefit for heart failure patients as well. So oftentimes we don't really use digoxin. The only time we use digoxin is if we cannot use beta blockers. Say you have a patient that has a low uh, B, uh, blood pressure and they're in AFib, you can't use beta blockers and you're really stuck, you can't use calcium channel blockers. Then in that case, we would often use uh, digoxin. But for old people, I mean, how, how long does it even take for you to be ch checking digoxin levels? You keep have to be checking digoxin levels. And oftentimes mm -hmm. these patients have renal failure. And we know with renal failure, the levels of digoxin increase. So it's not totally contraindicated, but it's not in the first therapies of use. I hope that answers uh, the question. Yeah. For yeah, a the next question is, uh, Dr. Kulte. Um, for a patient present to the emergency department with atrial fibrillation, could you expand or comment 
on the management plan that you expect to see in the major set department? Okay. So oftentimes, like I said, the pay, it depends if the patient presents hemodynamically stable or hemodynamically unstable. If they are hemodynamically unstable, there's no question. We have to cardiovert the patient, okay? And again, it depends. Is this new atrial fibrillation or is this old atrial fibrillation? So um, for patients that are coming in with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, they are hemodynamically stable. I mean, you have to look for, you have to ascertain what the stroke risk is for the patient and discuss stroke prevention with the patient. And before you refer them back, you don't just send them back to their family doctor without sorting this out. So you have to, you have to, have to, in the emergency department, talk about stroke prevention. But if they have rapid heart rates, it's, it's reasonable to start like something like a beta blocker. And if the beta blockers don't work, then you can think about starting amiodarone. Like I said, there is a stroke risk with amiodarone. Amiodarone compared to beta blockers, a patient starting on amiodarone, there's a risk of that patient developing atro, uh, sorry, stroke because you are cardioverting the patient. There is a, you know, as you use amiodarone and the patient goes into sinus rhythm, you can get atrial stunning. And with atrial stunning, you get stagnant flow and the patient can have, can have um, a, a stroke. So, um, and then that patient would probably need you think about the patient for the first time, they have atrial fibrillation for the first time, you have to look for preventable things, you look for thyroid disease, you look if the patient has sepsis, you look for anything that is correctable, COPD, things that you can correct in the emergency department or you can treat before you say the patient, oh, and the patient has uh, a primary, you know, uh, atrial fibrillation diagnosis. And the patient would definitely need an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram tends to risk stratify patients because you'll be looking at the size of your LA and um, that will tell you if the patient has had long term atrial fibrillation by the size of the LA, it gets bigger with persistent atrial fibrillation. And oftentimes in the setting of Africa, uh, non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation, which I didn't touch on, valvular atrial fibrillation is still a big thing for us because we have all these patients that have had rheumatic heart disease from long time ago. The fact that we still, we're not getting as much rheumatic heart disease right now, doesn't mean that those patients who had rheumatic heart disease are not still there. So they are at the stage where they are developing complications related to uh, rheumatic heart disease. So I think that on its own, I mean, emergency care of atrial fibrillation is a talk on its own. But I would, just to summarize it, I would say hemodynamic instability is key. If they are unstable, you cardiovert and you put the patient on anticoagulation, obviously, and you continue the patient on antiarrhythmic therapy. One thing that we should not forget, putting the patient on amiodarone does not mean the patient is going to cardiovert tomorrow. There's been studies that have been done and an effective dose for cardioversion for a patient that is stable before you cardiovert the patient, when you start them on amiodarone, you should get to 4.5 grams of amiodarone for you to actually have success in cardioversion. What you're aiming for is 10 grams of amiodarone. So there isn't really a magic pill in the, in the ER, but there are some drugs that you can use. In my hospital, I have, you know, in the hospitals, we have motiv motivated for some drugs. Like I highly encourage my um, emergency doctors to use IV drugs like IV metaprolol. It works like magic in the ER, you know, but at, the bad thing about it, it can decrease the patient's heart rate but you can use IV metaprolol if you have it, if you are scared of amiodarone, and you can use calcium channel block blockers for patients that have, don't have contraindications to it. And then if you have okay. a younger patient that comes to the ER with atrial fibrillation, like athletes, you know, we're seeing a lot of athletes, especially endurance athletes, like long marathon runners and stuff like that, they tend to develop atrial fibrillation as well. So those patients should actually be referred uh, uh, to cardiology as well for further management. But when you see them in the ER, there are a couple of things you can do, except for beta blockers, you can also offer them something called a pill in the pocket, which is flaconite. Flaconite is available in South Africa. So you can use flaconite. If they have palpitations, they just throw in the, 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 the pill, which is flaconite. But again, you have to make sure that the patient does not have structural heart disease disease for that. So at the end of the day, like I mentioned in the beginning, atrial fibrillation management is a, it, it needs a team of doctors to be managing if you are to manage it appropriately, because I can ablate, but I forget, 
about diabetes and uh, obesity. You know what I mean? I hope that answers think, partly the question. Yeah, well, I'm it's, happy. it's a lot to, to, to take in. It's a lot, lot to take yeah, in. I think a lot of information and, um, that you've shared here. I, I, I actually have a series of talks that I do about emergency care of atrial fibrillation, but we can talk about that later and we can uh, give references as to where to get that data from. Okay, I, th I think maybe if, if we can maybe just share the reference with us that we can okay. then send to the team, the colleagues who are connected. The next question is, uh, I don't know, can we see your hand is up at clinics? Is, is, is there a question there from your side? Hi, yes, Dr. Bila. Um, I just have a quick one for, for, for Doc. So Doc, um, with the case of a patient that uh, that's 29 years of age, patient showing um, arrhythmia, and is currently on Tambocor, right? Mm -hmm. um, would you suggest ablation for that patient? And what are the risks of ablation for, for a 29 year old? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, thank you for that question. I'm assuming this is a patient that has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, right? Well, the patient is not a doctor. So <laughs> um, I'm asking <laughs> um, in relation to what the patient was was told by the by the doctor when okay. they were consulting. So the patient was told that they have arrhythmia, um, so they need to be on that type of medication, and they have an I option see. to go for ablation. Yeah, young patients definitely. I mean, I think at this point in time, if you were to go to the court of law and they ask you. Um, you have a 29 year old and you are managing with amiodarone, um, you would actually be in trouble at this point because data is out there and it clearly states that ablation is superior to medication. So to keep a 29 year old, I think a 29 year old should be given an option um, and the chance for ablation. Even a 50 year old should. Actually a 50 year, those are the ones that we see, but more than anything, a 29 year old who has atrial fibrillation it needs somebody to go to dig deep into that story because a 29 year old is not supposed to have atrial fibrillation. So we can do genetic studies as well. Um, if we get those patients that are young and you can't find anything else that's causing atrial fibrillation, unless you are talking to me about somebody who's phenotypically metabolic, you know, like they are diabetic, they have a, an increased abdominal girth and, um, hypertension, then that's a different story. But if you're talking about a healthy young person, but they develop atrial fibrillation, it is a very strange scenario. So it needs to be uh, investigated. Okay. I hope right, thank you. That <laughs> Question, come is not a medical doctor or a healthcare worker, I mean, a, a health professional, but it's a good question that she's asking on behalf okay. of somebody. Okay. Next question is, how can atrial fibrillation be differentiated from tachycardia in primary care? So ECG, I think at primary care level, I think ECG is some, something that we are supposed to be doing even at that level. Um, atrial fibrillation is an ECG diagnosis. Previously, I mean, you know, we would talk about clinical signs of atrial fibrillation. But if you look at the sensitivity and specificity of picking up atrial fibrillation just using, using clinical maneuvers, it's not very, it's not a very sensitive test. So an ECG is still something that is of critical use. But I do understand the challenges with ECG reading at this point, you know. So um, I would say if there's no doctor at you know, in that hospital that can read ECGs, you can just send the ECG to somebody who's uh, closest to you. It, the ECG definitely has to be done. Patients that come to you with palpitations and they have risk factors, you, you have to do an ECG. In fact, if you are at a primary care level, at least a person that is at the age of 40 should be getting an ECG at least once annually. So if you come into contact with those people, they're supposed to be having ECGs. You're not supposed to be doing an ECG on a 15 year old unless they have risk factors, but the elderly and the, well, I'm not saying 40 year olds are elderly, but above the age of 40, we should be doing yearly ECGs. I, I don't know if there's a, a specific answer to that. I think it's a difficult one, especially if I'm dealing with a nurse and uh, they cannot really, um, you know, it depends on the level of the nurse, but obviously oftentimes ECG reading becomes a problem. 
but you should be able to refer to your doctor to give you, um, you know, uh, advice with uh, the ECGs. And um, oftentimes people just see an irregular heartbeat and they think it's AFib. AFib is actually more complex than an irregular AFib, P wave axis and stuff like that, which, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily pick up with just, you know, an irregular heartbeat. So when you said just said irregular heartbeat, refer. Irregular heartbeat, palpitations, refer. You can't refer. Yeah. I mean, there's PVCs, there's, you know, PACs uh, who will be clogging our system if you refer everybody. But you look, you, 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 you specify your, uh, you know, uh, uh, therapies or referral patterns to patients. If I have a 40-year-old hypertensive diabetic often coming with palpitations, obviously I would refer that patient if I don't have an ECG. You know, if I cannot have an access to ECG, but honestly speaking, ECG should be available in clinics, but I don't know if that is truly available because sometimes we can be stuck up in our, you know, tertiary care therapies and we think these are unreasonable, but these things should be available. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how, Dr. Pet Petkova, how soon after the first ablation uh, can the patient get the second one? And how healthy is, is it to get the repeated ablation? So um, that is a very good question because we don't know. That's the truth. Ablation is a very complex thing because uh, oftentimes you go in and depending on the LA size, of course, um, if the left atrial size is huge and the patient gets atrial fibrillation again, I mean, we try to give everyone a chance by ablating, even when the atrial sizes are big, but the bigger the atrial size, the, the worse the outcome of, uh, of your atrial fibrillation uh, ablation. But still, they still do better compared to drugs. But if I have a patient that has a normal LA and I have ablated, I go back again. And um, how soon, there isn't like a specific time as to how soon you can go back. But if the patient has symptoms, you know, I go back within a month or two months. But oftentimes there's that month where you, the patient actually has edema around the pulmonary veins because of the ablation that you've actually caused. So most people would say what is reasonable is about six weeks. Before that six weeks, oftentimes the patient comes to the lab with, amiodarone or with flaconide or any other antiarrhythmic therapies. So we just continue with those antiarrhythmic therapy, cardiovert, and wait six weeks. And then after six weeks, we have the discussion with the patient again. So in terms of atrial fibrillation, somebody asked about um, success. So atrial fibrillation success is about 60 to 70%, depending on the atrial size. But like I mentioned, and like data has shown, they do better in terms of AFib burden. So even if they go back to atrial fibrillation, they will still do better in terms of AFib burden compared to patients that are just on drugs. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say it is an excellent therapy, um, but I'm going to say it works better than antiarrhythmic drugs. There's a lot of uh, developments when it comes to technology of atrial fibrillation ablation, and we're hoping at some point we're going to get to a point where we say we have found a cure for atrial fibrillation. At this point, unfortunately, there is no cure for atrial fibrillation. There are things that you can do to improve the lifestyle of the patient, uh, but more than that, no, nah, there is no cure. Because atrial myopathy is a complex disease. Like I said, these studies that have looked at MRIs and histology, MRI ne uh, uh, negative for fibrosis, but when you look at histology, the patient had extensive atrial um, uh, 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 fibrosis. So it's a very complex uh, thing, but with data that is available currently in 2023, atrial fibrillation ablation, which is pulmonary vein isolation, every patient should be given that opportunity to go through it. How many times do we go? Personally, depends on the atrial size and the age of the patient. I go at least to number three, if the patient has normal atrial size 
and has, is still young. If the atrial size is big, we get to a point where you discuss pace and ablate. I mean, if you ablate the AV node, it's not going to come back again. You complete, you have complete heart block and you've given the patient pacemaker or a CRTD and that's what it is. Mm. Thank you very much. They, they, someone is calling it Dr. Lulum Tim Cool because uh, on the screen here, it shows uh, Lulum Tim Cool. Uh, the speaker is actually Dr. Vium Tracy, the colleagues. Um, patient asthmatic, over 60, uh, presented with extra systole, uh, but no other risk factor for atrial fibrillation, no other health problems uh, at risk. Uh, is a patient at risk for extra systole? Extra systoles, I mean, the definition of extra systoles is complex when I go to the electrical, you know, activity. Patients who have asthma in general, asthma and COPD, they tend to have um, more risk of uh, extra beats, be it is uh, premature atrial ectopy or premature ventricular ectopy, but most, mostly premature atrial ectopy. As you would remember in the first slides where I was talking about triggers for atrial fibrillation, most triggers for atrial fibrillation tend to come from pulmonary veins. And oftentimes patients that have primary lung issues, they tend to be at a risk that is higher for ectopy in general. Ectopy more so coming from, atria, from the atria. But in terms of atrial fibrillation risk, specifically for asthma. It de just depends on the stage of your asthma, but COPD patients, definitely. Atrial tachycardias, they develop atrial multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is oftentimes confused with atrial fibrillation. But those patients, because of the irregular patterns of multifocal atrial fibrillation, we tend to just put them on anticoagulation and just manage them like we would manage atrial fibrillation. So, uh, to summarize, yes, patients with lung issues tend to have premature atrial uh, complexes or extrasystolic uh, beats compared to people who don't have lung issues. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I don't see any other questions here, but just quite a number of people have said quite happy with the presentation that we need such presentation. Dr. Um, Tonga was saying that, uh, thanks for mentioning this operative management also, uh, yeah. and also that you, they're also quite colleagues or quite keen to having you doing other presentations. And I would trust that maybe you'll do these presentations in future. We, we know that you're quite available uh, being part of us, the clinics health group that you'll be there when we, requested to make other presentations. Yeah. Uh, any last uh, words from your side? Anything that you say, what message can you, uh, I, I mean, in, in a part of all what you've said that is so valuable. Any last yeah. words uh, on HR family? <laughs> when you say last words, I always think, oh my God, am I dying? <laughs> <laughs> last words for the evening. <laughs> a take home message. <laughs> yeah, no, because no, no. Thanks to everyone. Talk like this. <laughs> yeah, thanks to everyone who attended. I actually have a series of talks about uh, tachycardias, atrial fibrillation, and you know anything related to cardiac stuff with bonitas. Um, I just need to find out from them how you know other people can be involved in that talk. I think they share them somewhere. I'll find out. Um, and take it from there. Like I said, it's a big topic and I'm very sorry because the slides had to be clustered for me to just try and consolidate and put everything in one slide. But thanks for attending. And if you need to refer, ha, just there's my yeah. phone number. <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 I think what we'll do now, we'll ask the, the real Lulu Tim Kolo to come uh, and uh, be on the screen and just uh, give us the... Uh, so that the, we, we, we know that there, there is a, actually a real Lulu team code and that you are viewing yeah. team to see. And Lulu, just to do a word of thanks and uh, thanks for organizing. Uh, yeah. Lulu is our marketing manager at uh, Botelung Mpilioni Hospital and she is sitting there with the hospital manager. Uh, uh, send us and she will do the uh, word of thanks. And uh, thank you, Lulu.
Over okay, to you. so I kind of enjoyed being called Dr. Lulu for an hour. <laughs> but thank you, Dr. Bila. Um, again, I'd just like to um, thank everybody for attending. We are very excited as clinics and as Wutsilong to have Dr. Mdwesi to join us um, and at the hospital. Um, where she is available for um, sessions. You can book appointments with her. She's definitely at Wutsilong on Mondays. Thursdays and every second Friday of the month. But if anybody needs anything, she's also sent her details. But a huge, huge thanks to also our doctors who are here in the boardroom with us, Dr. Kabuzi and Dr. Lingane, who joined us here for this presentation. It was really amazing. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Mtuesi, once again. Thanks, Lulu. And thanks to Kamu for being part of the team that we work together with Kamu and uh, uh, to Komasondo to make sure that we we get these presentations, uh, different speakers coming uh, to share their knowledge and experiences with us. And also thanks to Clinics Health Group Management and Dr. Kenosh is here, our Chief of Operations, uh, who's joined us this evening also. And thanks colleagues and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me just...